Welcome to the Look Good, Move Well podcast. Yeah, who are some other like well-known behind the scenes media podcast producers that make appearances on good podcasts? We know Jamie from Rogan. Mm -hmm. He gets a shout out regularly. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I mean, I just listen to This American Life. And so I love when the producers of the show actually get on the mic and make their own little segments. Oh, that's good. Yeah. We were just saying that we need to get Nate. I know. uh, Yeah, Nate. An an additional camera and microphone because today's topic is going to be training related. And Nate, Nate's been crushing it lately in his his um, training. And so he, I think you have some, some good input for this conversation. But uh, before we dive into training, let's uh, address the elephant in the room, yeah. which is, um, Satya, are you aware that stance socks that you're wearing right now, they have um, a brand logo on it? Yeah. You know that? I do. Do you know that goes on the inner ankle, I not do. the outer ankle? I do know it goes on the inner ankle. You bet, but you, yeah, you've chosen to wear it on the outer ankle. Such is the state of my life today. <laughs> You'll also notice that I'm wearing workout clothes for this podcast. Podcast watchers, yeah. you may know that that's quite an anomaly. That's right. Right. So it speaks to my mental state that I give not a shit which side my logo is on, nor what I'm wearing today. Um, yeah, you opted to not do a costume change, but you did do a face. I just put on a little a lip because, fi- you know, I'm on camera. And a little face, a little face I did upgrade. a face redecorating. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. It makes me feel like I'm less of a, less of a scrub with my, you know. But you, you have my, your look. My, my you, attire. You're very like, I, I know. I mean, you're just like, oh, I'm a dude wearing gym clothes, but like the headband matches the shorts and the oh, shoes. Oh, for sure. And no, you I made, put I it made, all together. I've been kind of, maybe it's taken a little, you know, it's an extra five minutes a day to kind of just think about what's, what's, uh, what goes together. Yeah. I, I, I'm getting close to just like going on a minimalist kick because I feel like I'm getting decision fatigue around certain things in my yeah. day. I'm just like, like I've gotten, speaking of, we've talked about nutrition in recent podcasts, not today, but I'm going very, I'm trying to get minimalist on my, my, my nutrition these days. Like mm. basically Monday through Friday, when I have a pretty big list of stuff to do on every day, I'm like, I'm eating the same thing every day mm-hmm. and I'm prepping things that take pretty much no time. Yeah. So like I'm not making elaborate anything. It's like my overnight oats. I can whip those up five, five of them in like 10 minutes. Yeah. And I got Boom. Monday through Friday, my protein pancakes. I can basically make those. I can have those cooking while I'm making the overnight oats. And it's like, okay, I've got two meals. Th- those two meals get me out the door. Mm-hmm. Like I got breakfast and I've got like my post workout. Then for like my next meal before I get home is like white rice, which I batch cook easy, and that shredded chicken, which I batch cook, and that lasts like almost two weeks in the fridge. People are like you can keep that in the fridge for two weeks. I'm like, yes, I can. You don't need to worry about it going bad. It's totally fine. But like that's it. Yeah. And then when I get home in the evening. I feel like I life can slow down a little bit. I can whip up a salad and, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever my dinner might be. But it's just like so much more simple than things that I've done in the past where I'm like, I'm going to get a little bit of this. I'm going to have that. I'm going to get the right meat. I'm going to get the right this. I'm going to get it all in. Like, ugh. oats are easy. Yeah. Yeah. So trading some more efficiency there. Yeah, I feel you on the efficiency front for sure. I'm in that phase where I feel like every time I do something on my to-do list, it's replaced by five more things and I can just never get to the bottom of the pile. Yeah. And just a call out to like the decision fatigue that comes from like having to think through too many things. Like with regards to nutrition, it's like, yeah, like we've created the hierarchy scale of like, you know, start here, then move to here and then move to here. And like, not, it should not be assumed that like the further you go up the hierarchy scale, the better you are. It's like you find the place in your life and the way to approach nutrition that works best at that time Mm -hmm. and fits well. Yeah. And this could be said for like uh, processed food versus like, you know, whole foods that you cook yourself. It's like, look, 
the beauty of like a package process thing is that it's more convenient. Like I don't have to cook this thing. Like I've got a big old thing of rice cakes or I can go and scoop out the rice into the container or into the rice cooker, cook it, spread it out into containers, put lids on it, put it in the fridge, pull it out, add some meat to it. Like I could do that or I could just grab a thing of rice cakes, grab my big Tupperware of chicken, go to the gym. Like I got rice and chicken for lunch. Done. Like I don't, yeah. that didn't require anything, you know? Yeah. And so maybe there's a little process stuff that happens there or like, you know, anyway, it doesn't, I'm a big proponent. Obviously we are like cook whole, you know, ingredients, like as much as you can reach for those things, but you're trading some, you know, potentially some convenience or something, you know, it's like, if you don't have those skills yet to like make every meal with whole ingredients, foods, you know, taste good and in not, not taking up your whole day, like then figure out what's the step before. Yeah. You need to. What's the easy yeah. mode. Easy mode. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in easy mode for a little bit. Yeah. And with that being said, let's talk about training. <laughs> nice yeah, segue. You're you're not in easy mode when it comes to training. You had a really intense leg press set today. Oh my today. <laughs> lord. My lord, yeah. Well, it was uh to, yeah, today's you know, there's you could do uh I don't know. I've just been I've been spending a lot of time in investigation, education, upgrading my knowledge through experience mode with training. And, um, you know, I think we've talked about it in just recent episodes. Like, you know, there is no best training or best nutrition approach or best anything. It's really the one that you're going to follow. Mm -hmm. Yet there's still science that's out there that objectively points at this is better than that when it comes to building muscle. This is better than that when it comes to building aerobic capacity. This is better than that when it comes to, and this information continues to update and upgrade over the years as more thoughtful studies and uh, are conducted and publications come out. So, and then there's, there's, there's really great um, educators that are out there who are, on the forefront of sort of taking all of the relevant information, data studies, reviewing it for you and then putting it into a digestible format. And it's like, there's just a lot of that available. So now as compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, I can go into the gym and I can say like, I want to do a science based approach to training my legs. Like this is how you, this is how you build your legs with science, hmm. like current science versus building your legs with bro science or with, <laughs> you know, just age old principles that people do. Yeah. Some of them actually hold up against, you know, rigorous studies and some don't at all. Yeah. You know, the thing that always holds up is when you give lots of effort, you get results. Who knew? But you could give a lot of effort doing, you know, the suboptimal plan, or you could give the same amount of effort doing the optimal plan. And if you place it in the optimal plan, you might just start winning, you know, or being the best or having the biggest legs or, you know, making the gains the fastest. And, um, it's kind of interesting. It's like, Oh my God, like if I knew everything I know today and I could start over at the age of 15, where my potential to start building muscle and strength begin begins. And I could put together the ages from, from 15 to 30 years old training with like current day optimization strategies, I would, without question, be, have more muscle, be stronger, be, you know, measurably better in all ways today because I know that the effort thing was always going to be there. Yeah. But I didn't always train the right way. Yeah. Uh, I did a lot of dumb, dumb things. I just did the things that we did. And, you know, when I was 15, you know, 17 and then 20 and then, right? Like I just did it. And so now it's like, okay, I'm starting to learn these things and, Ah, right at 38, you know, like I'm getting some, I'm, I'm upgrading my knowledge and it's like, I can go and apply those principles. I can go explore them in training. I can go explore them in program design, but I'm not going to reap the same rewards of that that I would have when I was 25 or 30. Does that mean it's like, it's worthless? It's like, no, it's actually maybe more important than ever because as I enter into forties, fifties, where my ability to retain muscle and, 
uh, build muscle is like diminished. It's like, then you better be on point with your nutrition and you better be on point with best training principles and you better just, you know, cause I'm, I'm motivated to do that stuff anyway. Mm-hmm. So I may as well do the, do the best thing possible so I can, you know, stay muscular. I can stay functional. I can stay energetic. I can stay, you know, keep my metabolism high for years to come. Yeah. Well, how is everything that you're learning being folded into the training that you're writing for other people right now? Yeah, that's well, I think what what's most interesting to me is the what do people like? I've always tried to look at this like what do people want from their training or Mm -hmm. what's the box that training is checking for them? And where do you fit really on the spectrum of like (laughs) and since we're like in the functional bodybuilding, you know, brand, like, are you like, you really want to be functional, which in, in our experience is like, I really love CrossFit. I love to do functional fitness like CrossFit, or I really want to be a bodybuilder. I really want to just do everything by the scientific book to maximize muscle growth. And those two things are not, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're not in completely divergent in approach, but for the most part, they don't land on the same, they're, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum that I'm going to be discussing to be like the best CrossFitter in the world. You don't practice the best bodybuilding principles. You build a body because there are certain overlapping elements, but on the bodybuilding side, like you also don't build the greatest functional aerobic work capacity either you build great musculature, you build great strength, you can build great aesthetics, but you certainly won't be able to go and do Fran very well. And so where, where are people on that, you know, on that spectrum? And, um, the other terms that might, that come to mind when it's like about choosing and making choices around a training, um, program is entertainment versus efficacy. Hmm. I sometimes, you know, and depending on the person, you might find the most effective training principles highly entertaining or at least moder- moderately entertaining to the point where you'll do them. But some of the most effective training principles are highly, uh, they're, they're, they're quite boring, right? Like how do you build a huge aerobic capacity? You, you go and spend... 80 to 90% of your entire dedicated training to cardiovascular fitness at zone two doing the same shit. So just go get on a bike and ride for a couple hours a day with your heart rate at like 120 to 130 and just like, don't just stay, stay right there. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's how you do it. Yeah. And you might do some threshold work. You're going to do some pain work. But like, if you want to be really good at that, you got to go do that. That is boring. The people who start to see results and they they follow these boring programs, they get in love with the results. They see the results and then they get in love with how they feel doing it. And so that becomes the motivation. Not like, oh, it is like absolutely the most joyful thing to like sit on a trainer and just like ride and just look at my heart rate monitor. Like (laughs) it's not that, it's not that thrilling, you know? (laughs) Um, and same thing with like, you know, bodybuilding. It's like the, the most effective approach to building muscle is likely to go into the gym and to maybe choose like two, maybe three exercises, like, and just do straight sets of them near failure and basically like hammer a muscle group, move on to the next exercise, hammer it close to failure, like really hard work. That's not comfortable in like the 10 to 20 rep range and then pack it in. Like you did it. You got mechanical tension on the muscle you got an adequate amount of, you know, so there's an adequate amount of intensity. You got sufficient amount of volume. You got a great pump because you chose the right exercises that really allow you to have great mind-muscle connection, like focus on an area. And then 
you spent the rest of the day just making sure you nailed your nutrition. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's it. You know, and you see like, if you see, uh, you see a bodybuilder who's like doing this back day, there's like a video of like this back day and it's got like fifth, you know, uh, nine different exercises, like bouncing all around the room. Like, oh, like that looks super interesting. Look at all those different angles that they're pulling on. They're doing these different exercises. Like that's entertaining, but it's likely no more effective. In fact, likely less effective than the person who just comes to the gym and does, you know, what I did the other day, which is like, I did four sets of strict pull-ups basically to failure. Then once I got so smoked and I couldn't do eight reps anymore, I started doing banded pull-ups to failure and then once that was done, I went and did like some cable rows to failure and that was it. And my back is, you know, that was a, that if I repeat that stimulus once to twice a week with some other back training for the next three months and I eat well, like my back's going to get developed. Huge. But it's the same thing every yeah. day. You know, yeah. it's the same thing every week. Right. So anyway, functional versus bodybuilding. Mm-hmm entertaining versus effective yep uh highly effective training plans that optimize for muscle growth might be just a, a you you might it might just be a major obstacle for you to be compliant the actual effort level that must be given is just scary yeah. like i did that one hard set today like you were screaming it was really it was gnarly yeah i did a i built up to my top set last week on the leg press was was six plates for 10, and I, I thought I was going to fail. So today I went six plates for 11 and then did a drop set to four plates for another 10. And yeah, it was like, I, I, I wasn't right. I was not right for a little bit after that. <laughs> you took your time getting out of that I leg press machine. <laughs> yeah, and then when I stood up, I was like, oh my God, I'm, I need to sit down. I'm literally, you know, and you know- if I was truly trying to maximize and optimize that, this type of tra training, I, I might have to do another set of that in the first couple weeks of this cycle. Yeah. And then the last few weeks, it might be a third set or a fourth set. And I might have to do that for two other exercises. And it's like, okay, well that training session plus a bunch of carbs and protein afterwards, like I can pretty much just go and take a nap the rest of the day. Like that's just like my old CrossFit days where like, I didn't really have a lot else to give. Yeah. So the, the effort level might take to do this and to really maximize, like it just has a total negative impact on the rest of your life. <laughs> it's like the, the line that came out when I was doing the ready state podcast was like, you want to do, you know, bring as much effort as you can and put as much into your training to see results as possible without blowing out the rest of your life so that you can't, you know, be, enjoy it and get more, you know, entertainment and fulfillment out of the other things you have to do or, or produce something if you have to go to work and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, those, how, I know you asked a question in there it was, how is this impacting the programming? It's like, I like to explore this like both of both sides of this. And mm -hmm. I don't want people to think I, I really believe that like functional and entertaining aren't necessarily like, I shouldn't be putting them in the same category. It's like people are like, Oh yeah. Functional training is just entertainment. It's, it's not just entertainment. It's like functional training or the CrossFit or the mixed modal stuff that we do has utility and it can develop, attributes and characteristics of your fitness that you aren't going to develop on the other side of the, you know, pure bodybuilding training spectrum. Um, but it's, it's always a thought. Well, what are, what are, how can we inject best print, best principles and practices to certain types, certain aspects of training while also keeping the balance the variation, some of the entertainment and this blend of both in the same program. And as much as I th used to think like, you know, or I had hoped like, oh, maybe there's just like one iteration of this that makes it all work together. There's like the functional bodybuilding program is this. 
And people are like, hey, how do I do functional bodybuilding? I'm like, well, you come and you join Persist. And then when you get into Persist, there's these options for you because not everyone's in the same place on that spectrum. It's like, I want to do functional bodybuilding with a little bit more of the bodybuilding to it. Or I want to do a little bit more of the, you know, functional side of this. Or maybe I want to do a little bit less total training frequency and volume or maybe i want to right like that's how um that's how i think about program design and developing training options for people uh because at the end of the day like we we fit into you know people are very unique but we we kind of fit into different buckets when it comes to training and how much we desire each of these different things that i've discussed yeah absolutely i've been thinking about how some of our most popular training has really been in more of a bodybuilding style, but people come to us not because they want a traditional bodybuilding training program. And I've been thinking about how our audience really started with people who felt that burnout from CrossFit and forms of high intensity training that really f make you feel like your body's wrecked and how a bodybuilding style approach with our own version of that can feel so healing. Mm. And it has these benefits, obviously, of looking good and moving well. That's what we're all about. But I think what people get really hooked on is just how good it feels to do something like the pump track and to have that feeling of, I'm getting a great pump. It's super effective, but it feels like I'm finally giving my body the joint strength and stability and the tendon strength and the quality muscle contractions that I've been lacking in previous forms of training. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, I know you're right. And what I've learned too, is that, you know, while we were catering to a sort of a burnt out CrossFit uh, crossfitter audience early on you know you can burn yourself out on any training program yeah there's plenty of people that are cranky and all jacked up from bodybuilding super hard or powerlifting super hard mm -hmm. or olympic weightlifting super or hard or running super hard or running super hard it's like you know we all have a threshold how much we can tolerate in the way of intensity and and training volume and then that is equated to our ability to recover from those actions. And if you really want to push your physical abilities in any one of those disciplines, you have to flirt the line between like overtraining and just, you know, training just enough and overreaching. That's part of it. And so with, <clears throat> with that CrossFit audience, it was, what was interesting was that in the, pr like without even wanting to like, I want to win at CrossFit, the um the crossfit prescription was was so easy to dial up the intensity without even really knowing because there was and, and it was probably this combination of doing challenging skills and maneuvers and movements under a lot of fatigue so when you go and do like a thruster that that's not inherently dangerous, you know, but if you do thrusters when you're gasping for air, cause you just did a bunch of burpees and you jumped over a box and you're not well trained for that, then the, that becomes more risky and there's more opportunity for, you know, problems to come up. So it was like people that were just chasing this, high of the CrossFit feeling from those workouts that were putting themselves into this repetitive cycle of like overreaching without really necessarily wanting to like win the CrossFit game. So yeah. that's how that like people who are in the bodybuilding, you know, who train more conventional bodybuilding style, it's really, it's, it's a bit, I, f I think it's a bit harder to overreach there. Like mm -hmm. it really takes, it took, you know, the, the, I don't see a lot of people like getting overtrained in the like recreational like bodybuilding you know yeah. world where I saw a decent amount of people getting overtrained who are just recreational CrossFitters like they were 
feeling like overtraining symptoms and they were just like getting kind of wiped out from it, which I guess just speaks to the how that methodology can really ramp up intensity for people. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you can't overtrain doing bodybuilding or running and all the things that we just mentioned. Um, but then the, the second point you made was like, hey, if we introduce bodybuilding to this this crowd of burnt out CrossFitters, they started to feel better. Why is that? Not because bodybuilding's easy and not because bodybuilding is like this, you know, delicate, like, you know, rehab <laughs> protocol. Yeah, it's old people not. yoga equipment. No, <laughs> like if you go into a hardcore bodybuilding gym, like, and you watch bodybuilders like train really hard, like what are they doing on leg day? They're throwing up in the trash can <laughs> yeah. or on the floor or in the parking lot, like after workouts, because it's, it's brutally hard, you know? And, um, because <laughs> I also heard this awesome quote it's like um you know are you this is like the, it was some old school bodybuilder who's giving like making a case for intensity being like the most important thing you uh -huh. need in your training he's like do we have a problem of people building too much muscle <laughs> like do you walk into gyms and feel like man i'm just building muscle so easily it's like getting out of hand like these moderate rep you know, moderate weight sets I'm doing over here. And I'm just hulking out. Like I just need to, it's like, no, we have no, there's no problem of people growing muscle too fast. Uh -huh. So like your body doesn't want to grow muscle. You got to do something extraordinary to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that's just more to the point that like to make it really work, you got to really push it. And, but what does slowing down and that one of the things that like, you know, despite what you might see out there from like old school bro science bodybuilders of like swinging weights around and, you know, using, you know, using momentum and doing cheat reps, like that isn't really the best way to use bodybuilding to build muscle. The best way is to train through full range of motion, train with control, mm -hmm. use in many cases like pauses and things like that. And, execute movements with just the simple like idea of control was a huge departure from the concept of like move fast against the clock. Like there was no control in CrossFit. Um, those people who move with more control were better because they just had more refined and efficient movement. Like the person with like a really tight, crisp thruster would finish Fran faster than the person who was kind of like knees buckling and kind of just like Flopping wonky around. and floppy mm -hmm. and just sort of, you know, had loose shoulders and their lockout was all over the place, right? But there wasn't a requirement. It wasn't really encouraged. And it certainly wasn't the way at any point in your fitness to like go faster was to be like, let me get a, I'm going to get my best Fran time, but I'm going to focus on a slow squat and I'm going to really like lock out and squeeze at the top. Yeah. Like, like when is the coach going to come in and be like, actually you need to like do your, this with your bar path in right, that like right, right, 30 right, seconds right, that you're like right. just dying on thrusters. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we should go do like, you know, F Fran with a tempo yeah. and it's like, okay, it's just a whole totally different thing. It's not the same thing, but what is the value of that? Well, the value of slowing down and having more control and movement was like basically removing these fatigued, crappy positions that people were getting into where they were causing musculoskeletal damage and feeling beat up and hurt. And so it was like fixing people's aches and pains. Mm -hmm. It was actually helping them develop a different type of strength. So when you move against intensely with the purpose of just like lifting the heaviest thing or lifting the fastest that you can, you will adopt compensatory patterns in your body. That basically means like I take your body and I say, go and press as hard as you can against this, this foot plate. All right. And if I like measured, if I had a way to do this, if I measured like, EMG readings and, you know, if I could take like, where's the torque and where's the pressure on your, your skeleton, your pattern of like where all of the force is being driven from and where your body is receiving the force would look dramatically different than mine because I have a different comp com compensatory mechanism to, to produce maximal force. Like I'm going to leverage my quads and my knees and my ankles and my 
chest and my shoulder, whereas you're going to leverage your hip, your left hip and your low back and your hamstring. And like, it's just going to look different. Yeah. That's what happens when you max out on anything. Mm -hmm. Your brain just goes, what's the best way I can do this? With the body that I've developed over 38 years or however old you are or whatever. Now, if you dial that back to like 80%, then you can suddenly change your how your body engages. You can override the like, oh shit, I'm going as hard as I can, just do whatever it takes. You can override that system and you can say... Nope, I'm just going to do it this way and I'm going to really try and fire my quads and I'm going to make sure my knees stay out over my toes and I'm going to, what right? Like you can manipulate your movement pattern so that you actually train specific areas of your body. Now, if you're going for one rep max back squat in a competition, do you care if you're squatting with your quads or your knees over your toes or whatever? It's like, no, you care that you get the most weight up. And whether you shift your hip to your left or you fire your glutes more or you use your quads more or you high bar, low bar, whatever, it doesn't matter. There's no style points for using more quads in a powerlifting meet. Mm -hmm. There's no style points for using more quads in a thruster pull-up combination. But... When you bodybuild, there are style points for that because you develop your quads more when you do it this way. And when you want your quads to be developed, then you better do more of those, even if you have to do it at 70% of the maximum weight that you can lift. So to bringing that concept into training to somebody who's a CrossFitter, that's what we, that's, that's, that's the introduction of that principle into functional bodybuilding that is so was was so and still is so unique. It's let's do functional training with the mindset of it matters that your quads are working in this movement. It matters that you're performing the exercise correctly. It matters that when you do the landmine meadow row, you train the rear delt and the upper back, not your lat. How do we do that? P slow down, watch the demo videos, execute the movement correctly once it's dialed in and you're doing it correctly then overload it fine go a little bit more than last week and this is what's being built in and this is what i'm continuing to like investigate more and more is that i used to be a bodybuilder or train with conventional bodybuilding principles mm -hmm. But even then, I didn't appreciate the concept of mind-muscle connection as much as I can appreciate it now. And as much as like the science continues to support and show evidence for when we do things in these particular ways, when we train joints at specific angles, when we train muscles at certain stretched lengths, then we get better contractions there and we can get better growth in those muscles. And does that mean I don't want you to ever do a functional movement again because the best way to train your bicep is in a preacher curl stretch position? You know, like that shows the best growth for biceps. It's like, nope. It's just adding to this body of knowledge and evidence that suggests that having control over movement is valuable. Let's then take that into the variety of different approaches that we bring to our training. And if you really want to dive deep into like optimizing hypertrophy through some of these bodybuilding principles, I want that to be available in our programs. If you want to be able to really dive deep into that, but also still have work capacity and functional training mixed in and intertwined together, we need to have that. And if you really want to continue to pursue functional fitness as your principal thing that excites you and gets you in the gym and feeling confident, but you want to add in control to your movements and do strength balance work to support that, we, we want to have that available as well. So this is how the training tracks of Persist are evolving, is to say, we're upgrading our knowledge. I'm upgrading my knowledge. We're upgrading the delivery of these different blends of training mm -hmm. so that you can choose what feels most, what feels best for you and what keeps you 
engaged, excited, and and wanting to to keep training. And it might it I would guess that it'll change over time, and you'll want to explore different things. Just like I'm kind of in more of like a I want to explore the principles of training that are most effective, maybe not the most exciting or entertaining, but the most effective for building, you know, muscle. Um, because I'm just very curious and interested to experience that fully. Cause I put a lot of time into the other side of this thing over the past decade. Yeah. Would you say you've had a specific light bulb moment in training or anything that really stands out to you as a way to put this into focus? Um, yeah, yeah. One of the biggest light bulb moments or concepts is this idea that there are, there are likely movements for each person that are the, are the best movements for you, that there are, we explore a lot of different movements and a lot of variety in our training. And I think that that's still something I'm deeply curious to keep doing in my own practice of movement Mm -hmm. because there are probably like two leg exercises and two chest exercises and two back exercises and you know two to three exercises for each part of the body that are best for me to get get muscle building results and strength results from if I just did those over and over again in, you know, for three to six months at a time, trying to progress them and just kind of rotated them back and forth, like that would be like my best bang for my buck, so to speak. But bang for my buck in terms of like specific muscle growth. Yeah. But that's not my only goal in life. Yeah. It's not my only goal with training. Um And the reason those are the best movements for me is because of how all those compensatory things that I talked about that we've built, my limb lengths and my particular body shape, um, how I best connect mine to muscle and the equipment I have available to me, you know? So as we're, I think that that's something that I I want people to start to learn from themselves too. Yeah. Like these, this is my, these are my money movements. Mm -hmm. These are not my money movements, but I like doing them. They're Mm -hmm. fun. They give me joy. Like they help me to maintain the ability to do a variety of different things. And if I continue to include them, they're not going to be my big intensity exercises, but they're going to be my balance exercises. My, you know, the things that keep me, um, keep me in the game longer, keep me being versatile. And, um, ultimately like if you just stick to the four exercises that are the best ones for you, guess what? After about three months of training them, it's brutal Yeah, because you've maxed out like the gains like, and now it's like these incremental gains where you have to push at so hard. pretty hard, heavy weights. And that process is like, you know, that's like now you're, you're competitive in this sport of trying to build muscle and it's really hard and you can, you know, it's, it's a lot of intensity. Yeah. So mixing in some other things to just sort of like break that up and, you know, give you opportunities to keep moving without piling on intensity. It's like... If, if you want me to, I'll write you a program where there's four things to do and each one blows your face off and tell me how you feel after six weeks. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> you're going to feel terrible. Like I people say like, Hey Marcus, you got that super set in there. And like, you know, like every 90 seconds just didn't feel like I could like really get after it on every set. I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> Like you don't need to get after it on every single set. If you do get after it on every single set, you'll feel awesome this week. You'll feel good next week. And in four weeks, you'll be like, dude, Marcus, this program's like, I'm like overtrained. I'm like, I know. Yeah. That's why we're not doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that aspect. And that's something that would be 
really exciting for us to start adding more to the program to teach people how to feel what the best things for you are and how to relate to those in an ongoing way in your training. Yeah, for real. Well, we went over time on this one. Thanks for uh, the time checks, Nate. And uh, any final closing thoughts? No, I'm just, I'm, um, I just trained, but now I'm pumped to go back after it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I, that that You're leg not. press set. You had your face blown that off. That leg press set, I <laughs> blew my face off and then I did some 200 pound sandbag stuff. And I You're feel like my right well. side's a little, like this twisting position yeah. I'm in right now. I'm like, <laughs> I need to go get on a foam roller or sit in a sauna or I don't know. Okay. Go get in a cold plunge. Right on. Take me out of my misery. (laughs) Have a great day, everyone, wherever you're at. We'll see you next time. Bye.